Welcome to Blood Flow, where creativity meets science. I'm Jonathan Hamill, a doctor specialized in blood circulation and a novelist from Paris. On this podcast, through conversations with uh, world-class experts in the domains of science and art, we will explore the hidden links between the pulse of life and the rhythm of creativity. My guest today is Graham Simpson. Graham is a New Zealand-born Australian author, screenwriter, and playwright. He is a former IT consultant who, at age 50, decided to try his hand at a new career and become a writer. His first book, The Rosie Project, was first developed as a screenplay before being turned into a novel, which turned out to be a good idea. After being published in 2014, it went on to win eight awards, selling over 3.5 million copies and being translated into 40 languages. Two more books followed in a series that came to be known as the Rosie Project Trilogy. His other work includes The Best of Adam Sharp, Creative Differences, and the Two Step series with his partner, Anne Buist. Graham also wrote a guide for writers called The Novel Project, which we can see right behind him, numerous short stories, and two books on data modeling. He was also involved as a writer, producer on many short films and plays. His new book, The Glass House, co-written with Anne Buist, takes us on a fascinating dive into the lives of young psychiatrists. He will be available everywhere books are sold on March 27th. Graham, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me, Jonathan. It was a wonderful introduction. I had nothing you. to say. <laughs> well, we'll start now. Okay, so so you wrote uh, this book, The Glass House, with uh, your partner, Anne Buist, who happens to be a professor of uh, psychiatry and the chair of women's mental health at the University of Melbourne. What was the pull? What was the main reason uh, you wanted to write this book? Uh, was there a particular event that prompted you to go on this journey together? Yeah, look, um, in fact, we, we felt that um, we originally had a TV series in mind. So you, you see all of these medical drama series, and I think Anne pointed out one day, um, you know, we never see anything about psychiatry or if we do it's that one flew over the cuckoo's nest model which is somebody locked up forever or it's the in treatment model where someone's lying on the couch forever talking about their mother or, or whatever it might be and yet the enormous amount of psychiatric interventions um, a relatively short term um, the, the condition is is episodic just as it might be with a physical condition and, and they can be life-threatening um, just as much as um, as a physical accident can be so we said, why are there so many physical medical drama series around and none in psychiatry? So we pitched it to a few uh, um, producers, uh, to the uh, national TV you know, provider here, and they were totally uninterested um, because, and frankly, in their minds, it was going to be somebody locked up forever or lying on the couch. Um, so we did what had been successful with the Rosie Project. We said, let's write it as a book first and... Uh, See if there's an interest there, and you know we we had significant TV interest. I can't uh, I can't comment on the state of the TV situation, but we're very optimistic. Um, but we had significant TV interest even before we had a publisher for the book. Oh, well, wow. great. Um, so can can you tell us a little bit about the, the process of writing with uh, four hands? Was it kind of similar to what you did prior with uh, your other books that you wrote together? Yeah, look, we, we've worked out how to write together now. This is our third book together, and we've in fact drafted the fourth, which will be a sequel to this to this book. So, um, look, I mean, I'm a guy who's come from a, a science and a technology background, and you get very focused on process. You say, well, what works, what doesn't work? Can we can we codify this process so that our experience um, is something we can carry forward to the next to the next job? Um, so far, far more than Anne, I guess, I was focused on saying, can we come up with a process here that will yeah. enable us to use our creativity without constantly wasting that creativity on trying to work out how to work together or, or indeed breaking up our relationship? So um, what, what we've ended up doing is we plan together. We use a screenwriter's approach to planning, which involves laying out the story on index cards, and we work very hard with that until we have a story that might be 100, 120 cards. Um, and, and this, because we're following a TV um, style, a season style story structure, we're talking about 13 episodes, um, which will become 13 chapters. So you've got your cards grouped and within each of those 13 episodes, you maybe have 10, 12 cards showing how the, the, the action plays out. 
And, and at that point, and we've got the characters worked out as well, we've got a very detailed plan. At that point, Anne takes over and she writes frantically. In, in a rush of blood, she, she writes six, 7,000 words a day sometimes. Wow. And so two weeks later, we have a draft. And um, you know, it's it's appropriately called a vomit draft. It's not, not pretty necessarily. Um, and she's much more tolerant than I am of, of sort of just errors, grammar, and so he just gets it down. And then she shows it to me, and I say, "What have you done?" <laughs> so, but 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 we we go we then go back and forth through a a, a long editing process to really <laughs> polish to polish that up. Um, but it's quite organised. It's, it's in your hands, Graham. It's in your hands, Anne. Um, I, I, that's a simplification. I, in fact, write a couple of chapters myself. Um, but uh, but that, that's essentially the process. Yeah, and you can really tell that it's two people. It's very you know, homogenous when you read it. And so it, I mean, it probably works. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, it does because every chapter has been through essentially the same process. Though, hmm. for, for your benefit, the last chapter, which is told from a God's eye point of view, whereas everything else is told from the point of view of our protagonist, I hmm. wrote um, at least the first draft. Um, and chapter two, I wrote the first. Actually, chapters two and the, the, the story with the autistic um, character and the autistic woman were, were both written by me originally but they've been through so many redrafts yeah. and polishing that those rough edges get get knocked off those differences yeah. get knocked off yeah interesting uh so i wanted to get a little bit into the the research for the book as well uh before all the card writing and everything i'm supposing there was a lot of research because the the descriptions in the book are very precise and very believable um it really feels like you're in this glass house you're in the ECT room with the patients and the doctors. Uh, I was wondering, how did you manage that degree of authenticity? I'm guessing because uh, Andrew is, is, in fact, a psychiatrist, but did you yourself have the opportunity to follow doctors on night calls to go see patients with them? No, I trusted Anne totally. So Anne was the, um, I mean, we, we both tend to write from real life. Um, you know, uh, my, uh, um, fellow Australian Hannah Kent, for example, writes about 19th century Iceland. And, you know, and, and then she writes about, you know, Irish, you know, olden times in, in Ireland and so forth. So, so she's clearly basing her writing as like Hilary Mantel, you know, writing about Tudor times. They have to do a great deal of research. Now, I would argue that people are people and you can still borrow human emotions and, and characteristics from the present day, but you have to do a great deal of research. Whereas... We've always taken a let, let's write about something that uh, a space that we're familiar with. Let's um, ask what if, and we will do variations on that. But we essentially wrote it um, based on Anne's experience. So what was written on the page was Anne's experience. As you say, chapter thirteen has very little to do with you know psychiatry per se, but is rather about the the impact on people. So I can fairly easily occupy those shoes, and Anne can say no, but that wouldn't happen, and we we, we sort that out. But what we did, because it was so important to us that this book was authentic, to, to, to us that was one of its uh, was going to be one of its trademarks, that we ran every chapter past a specialist um, in that um, particular area. So where we've got an anorexia nervosa patient, we ran that case past um, somebody who specialised in that area. Um, we also ran it past a few um, what they call consumers here, people with lived experience, people who had admissions themselves, um, in acute units of psychiatric hospitals to say, is this what it looks like to you, even though we're writing the clinician's point of view? So, but, but you know, really we had a very thorough draft done before we started running it past people for authenticity checks, almost like okay. proofreaders. And did they, did they have uh, some, uh, some changes? Some, uh, did you have to change something after running it through them? Yes, but nothing, nothing enormous. I don't think anything came out that had to be changed beyond the paragraph level. Hmm. Um, so you've mentioned this, uh, uh, the book allows us to, to explore different mental health issues, which is really important. Uh, there's postpartum psychosis, anorexia nervosa, I just mentioned depression, autism, early stage psychosis. Uh, during your research for the book uh, and your conversations uh, with your wife and patients, uh, what were some of the most surprising things you found out about some of these illnesses that you weren't aware of? Look, I think the the thing for look, I I've been um, with Anne for thirty five years, and 
prior to that, my partner was also a psychiatrist, so I'm a <laughs> repeat offender. So th to be honest, there wasn't a huge amount that surprised me. Um, it's actually what surprises our first readers. And what, what surprises me is the ignorance out there about psychiatry, things that I take for granted. People who are you know, intelligent, educated people who say, oh, I thought once you went to a psych hospital, you'd never got out. Mm. And, and yet, yet literally 99% of people who are psych have psych admissions um, are out in a relatively short period of time, just the same as if you, you know, break a leg or whatever. You can say, I'll never be, you know, never be out in the community again. So that, that was probably the, the, the biggest one, the idea that, um, that, that psychiatric illness was not episodic. Um, and, and also that if you um, had, for example, schizophrenia, you were always unwell rather than episodically unwell. Um, and I think that, that's a big eye opener for people. So these were some of the myths that we wanted to uh, disabuse people of. Yeah, and what about uh, ECT? Because there's a big part about uh, this uh, sort of treatment. And in the book, even uh, Hannah Wright, the, the main protagonist, has some uh, you know, misgivings about it, uh, which is kind of interesting. because She's a doctor, registers, I guess, almost. Yeah. Uh, well, she's a doctor, yeah, but she's, she's not a she's, psychiatrist she's, yet. Yeah, she's a trainee um, and she's picked up some of the um, the prejudices, um, the, the folklore and so forth around electroconvulsive therapy. I mean, I think one flew over the cuckoo's nest has got a lot to answer for. And you know, the betrayal in, in yeah, the betrayal in um, popular um, popular culture of ECT has almost invariably been one of, of horror, of punishment, um, very little about its therapeutic value. And look, we wanted to be we wanted to be balanced about that. We wanted to acknowledge in the book that there were still very significant fears around about it, um, that perhaps some doctors were too quick to to use it ahead of uh, antipsychotics, but equally um, that sometimes that might be the preferred treatment um, that for postpartum psychosis, which is what the case that we're talking about here, um, our, our medical expert Nash says, look, this is this is my preference. This is where I would go first if yep. I was allowed to. Um, so, look, again, we, we are not trying to get on any sort of soapbox and, and advocate as much as inform, as much as to say, look, these are, this is the balanced view. Yeah, no, it comes through. And then, like all treatments, it has side effects. And you mentioned these. So it's a, and then you can see the patient uh, get better, which is also yeah. interesting. Um, so I feel like one of the themes of the book uh, is uh, silence and silences and what people are not telling us, which is obviously part of psychiatry. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes Hannah is interpreting someone, another character, what, what another character is saying. Other times she has to wait uh, for the, the silence to be filled. Um, when you're writing uh, either novels or screenplays, how careful are you about the information uh, you give the reader and the information you leave out? And is there like yeah. a little bit balance to be found? And how do you, how do you, the writer find it uh, in your opinion and experience? You know, when I, when I, when I started off writing, I, I started off learning screenwriting. So I studied screenwriting first. And, and I think um, m most of the, 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 the student screenwriters didn't make any films. They didn't have any of that, didn't actually get to see any of their work on the screen during the whole of their course. Mm -hmm. um, a couple did actually, a few did actually get something made. And I got 10 short films made, lots and lots, because I engaged with the, um, the audiovisual students, not, not the wannabe directors, um, mm. but, but the guys who were learning to use microphones and, and, and we'd bring in a director sometimes. And we, made, we got a couple of these shorts, many of them into festivals, and a couple of them shown on television, even sold to Swedish television. We had a lot of success with these. But what was great for me as a learning experience was to be – I'd have written a script and I'd be standing in the editing room as they were editing and you'd see, you don't need this. The mm -hmm. actor has just said something was entirely unnecessary. What we're just telling the audience, get rid of it. And I learned, and the actors, when you were shooting it and you would write, you know, she says angrily, you know, get out of here. You, know, you say, what's the angrily doing there? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously yeah. she's going to say it angrily. So, um, so you learn a lot about, about what the, um, the reader, um, well, the viewer initially, um, can actually work out for themselves. Equally, I have to say, um, there's a counterbalance to that, which is that sometimes you think something is crystal clear, that a situation is crystal clear, and the person reading or watching will put a different interpretation on it. You think you've been clever, you said, here's the great moment, and they say, oh, you know, like I, I, had a, I did a little short film and we get the kid takes his, his hat off and he's outside the cancer centre and you realise that the kid is, has had 
you know, cancer. And this is a big, big reveal at the end of the film. And people would watch that and say, why did the kid shave his head? You know, is that something? Is he a punk? Is it? <laughs> All this sort of stuff. But, but, but broadly speaking, um, you know, leaving things out is really important. And, and I would say that most of us, almost every writer I know, overwrites. They write too much the first time, and it's only in the redrafting process that you start to say, what don't I need? That's there. It's obvious. And, and there, are, there are techniques. There are tricks. I mean, you, you look for those adverbs because often you know, they're not necessary. Can, can it be clear in speech what's being said? Can it be clear in speech who's saying it? Um, right. and, and, and pretty quickly, um, and, and what, you know, what their emotional state state is and so on and you learn to do that better and do you do you sometimes read uh, what you've written uh, aloud uh, to see if something is uh, not necessary yep. we didn't do it with the glass house we were a bit slack but we did so many drafts and had so much <laughs> editing going on because we changed publishers in the middle of it and we had it well, all the way to proofread by editors just sort of structural edit copy edit changed okay. publishers and of our own volition said, look, we'd like to go right back to square one, do another structural oh, yeah. edit, copy edit. So by that time it was, it was pretty complete, but right back with the Rosie project, my first book, um, I sat down and poor long suffering and listened to me read the entire thing through from cover to cover. And we did that with our other books too. And you spot stuff, you see stuff that, it, that the eye doesn't see. Oh yeah. I, 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 I do that all the time with what I'm writing. I always read it out loud uh, and it's, you know, reveals things like, oh, I already said this and, you know, this doesn't yeah. come out right. So, yeah. um, so one of the only characters in my opinion doesn't have a problem with filling in the blanks of silences is a uh, Carrie, because uh, <laughs> he just says whatever he wants. So can you tell us a little bit about this character and how you constructed him? Okay, so well, I've got to say them to be Sorry, correct. Yeah. I, them I because they, they, they they're quite <laughs> non-binary, but they present as male, and that's something that you know people people struggle with a little bit. Um, look, look, part of it was we wanted to show the diversity of people, um, not just amongst the patients, but amongst the amongst the staff. And, and Melbourne, where where I live, is a a pretty multicultural city. In fact, I think it's one of the most, I believe it's one of the most multicultural cities in the world, according to some to some measure. Um, and, and it's got the, um, the well, it's probably always had the, the full range of sexual orientations and gender orientations and so forth, but people are much more out about that than they were some, some years back. Um, and you know, the, the, the entire Rosie series was about an autistic character. And I thought there was room to have an autistic character in, uh, um, in the glass house. And we made them a non-binary person because I believe that um, gender um, fluidity, at least, uh, rather than saying dysmorphia, but um, and certainly um, sexual orientation is more variable in um, people who identify as autistic than it is in the general population. So that, that's a fairly legitimate pick. And in fact, one of our um, one of our beta readers, one of our sensitivity readers, in fact. Um, is uh, non-binary and autistic and, and a really strong, and it also has schizophrenia. So he's somebody who is a, a strong mental health activist um, and, and a wonderful role model in some ways, well, because I, I know them quite well um, and they hold down a you know, significant job, um, um, but obviously have episodes when they're not as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it, it, it was took a little while to uh, get used to the to when I was reading. But then I, you know, you understand why you do it. Yeah, I have to say that working with um, uh, you know, with they as a pronoun rather than he or she is actually quite awkward the first time you do it. And um, there are there are phrases where people are going to read it and say, "There's two people here," or just as working with he and she and so forth, if there's two women in a conversation, you're going to have to use she more sparingly than if there's a man and a woman in a conversation. Yeah. So it's just um, learning the rules and the ropes to do that well. Mm. So uh, so the book follows uh, Hannah Wright, so a young register and on her path to becoming a psychiatrist. Um, um, without giving away too much of the plot, we see that there are events in her past that have led her to this career choice. Um, so you famously changed your career path uh, at age 50 after being a data analyst. Uh, but I'm being a data analyst. 
So uh, I was wondering, uh, if you look back, were you always a, a storyteller, even before you became a professional writer, uh, either through telling jokes or stories or just writing data modeling? Yeah, look, that, that's, that's uh, very accurate. I mean, you could have asked if I'd written much fiction before um, before I started as a writer, and the answer was no. I mean, I, unlike Anne, I had not been writing fiction all my life and just sort of seeking to have it published or to improve my craft. Um, but I'd written two books on data modeling, um, and, and they, they, particularly the first one is, which is a, a general you know, professional's book. It, it's been in, still in print, so it's been in print for coming up 30 years, I guess. Um, and that's, I think it's stayed in print because it's clear and, and it, you know, it is well expressed. Um, so I've always enjoyed using words well. Um, and I used to do a lot of teaching. I used to run a lot of industry courses and so on. And I would fill in with stories and anecdotes and jokes. So, um, I think, I think it's fair to say I've, I've always been inclined to be a storyteller, but, but you know what, there's a huge difference between telling a story that goes for one minute. You know, if you're at the at the pub, at, you know, at the bar, and and you're you're telling a story, and it starts to go over two or three minutes, people are going to say, "Come on, man! <laughs> What's the point here? Where, where are you going?" And and this is the point I make in my book, the novel project, that the, this is where people start to struggle when they become writers, that they're not that the extended story of eighty thousand words that will take seven, eight, nine, ten hours to read aloud. You imagine holding people captive in a pub for seven, eight, nine hours. It's a whole, it's a whole different challenge, and that's where you know, where stru story structure comes in at a quite different level from from what you're doing when you're when you're telling an anecdote. Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, you studying screenwriting, even though you were already a storyteller. So because after five years of uh, studying screenwriting, uh, failing to get the movie made, you decided to write the Rosie Project as a novel. But what I find really interesting is you studied for five years to learn screenwriting, and then you learned uh, about novel writing as well, right? Uh, which not every writer does. Uh, so there's very, um, very, uh, how would I say, structured approach. Uh, what are some of the, the most valuable lessons you learned from your teachers during uh, that time, either screenwriting or later novel writing? Well, well let, let, let me say, I mean, I studied at RMIT, which is an excellent institution in Melbourne, where they have a very highly regarded professional writing and editing course, which is that the novel writers do, and a very highly regarded screenwriting course. I would say that there are more novels have come out of the screenwriting course than have come out of the novel writing <laughs> course, and certainly more successful you know, mm -hmm. novels, um, I say certainly, it seems to me. Um, I mean, the Rosie Project would, would, would help a lot there in that, in that score. Um, And I think it's because that the strength of the screenwriting course is structure. It teaches you to, the, the, the shape of a feature film, typically, or a TV series now, nowadays, particularly an extended TV series. These are big stories. I mean, something like uh, you know, you know, some of these um, TV series that are coming up in their four seasons or so, that's an enormous amount of storytelling. Um, And, and the strength of the novel writing course was much more in writing uh, a brilliant thousand words. So um, I, I probably took more. I think my readers would say I took more from the screenwriting course than the novel writing course, and that there are plenty of people around who could write a better sentence than me. Um, I like to think I'm, I'm competent, um, but there are people who write beautiful, beautiful prose, and, and that's I write serviceable prose, uh, but I write good stories. Mm. Yeah, and I would say that that's the most important to get the reader to continue reading. Um, well, well, I, I, what I, is I, it's a shame when I read beautiful prose that you find hard that the readers find hard to engage with because the underlying yeah. story has, um, you know, has really significant faults. You know, you, so yeah, you, that could actually be made a lot stronger without in any way compromising the quality of the prose. Um, mm -hmm. And and that person would then perhaps have some sales to go on top of their their critical acclaim. Yeah, 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 sure. Then it just becomes poetry. <laughs> well, that's right. And, and poetry is, is generally relatively short because our concentration, yeah. the intensity of that is so great and it's so wonderful when it's, when it's good. But to, to be able to read 80,000 words of poetry starts to become hard work if there isn't some, you know, if you're not reading Beowulf or something like that, it's got a structure that's holding it together. 
Yeah. Uh, so in your bio, you mentioned uh, Michelle Ongfin uh, as one of your teachers. Or what were some of the core prin principles retained from uh, from her teachings? Okay. Well, I had, I had a number of teachers. I had um, Tony Jordan as well as, as a novel teacher. So I had, had two teachers basically who, who taught me novel. And Tony Jordan's a very popular um, popular writer, particularly here in here in Australia, and, and, and very respected as well. Um, so um, so so she was she would look. She was excellent. The, the strength of Michelle Unthin was that she had an academic background in writing, and that suited me. Um, I'm always interested in the underlying theory. So, um, one of your uh, compatriots, uh, Gerard Jeannette, um, is a, a, a guru on, was a, a guru on narratology, and I found that whole idea of, of deconstructing or analysing. Um, uh, work to say, you know, is it seen? Is it summary? Is it um, is it pause? How, you know, how does it work? Actually, um, actually useful to me. Not so much that you you use it as a formula to write to, but it helps you analyze what's helps you analyze what's going wrong. You, know, you say, why is the scene not working? You say, it's too much summary, too much pause, not enough, um, not enough scene, for example. Yeah, rather than just feeling something's off without yeah. knowing what it is. Yeah, I mean that, that's always been my my way. That I wanted to I wanted to codify my my knowledge. If I learned something, I want to say, how can I put this in words or as a rule or a guideline so that I can continue to do it and stop yeah. worrying about it and stop waiting for my instincts to get it right and say, or at least say, when my instincts don't get it right, can I look at it and say, what's going, what's gone wrong here? Yeah. So I went just uh spend a little time discussing this and your, your creative process because you uh so you went and had a phd at the university of melbourne yeah. uh, as you say in your ted talk to know if data modeling was a creative process yeah. <laughs> so once you found out that it was the case um what main principles from uh, design thinking um were you able to apply to uh, screenwriting and the novel writing and do you still use them uh, today yeah, look, look. It, was, it turned out to be um, to be fortunate that I took on screenwriting before novel writing. By the way, the reason I did that first was deep down, I think I always wanted to be a novelist, but I didn't think I was up to it. I didn't think I had the capability. But going via screenwriting meant that yeah, there's a bit of an attitude in the screenwriting that if you get the basic you know, premise and, and plot right, other people can can fix it up and and so <laughs> forth. It, it's not as hard. It's certainly a lot harder to get something actually up and successful, but you know, to get something adequate is not. I don't believe. I don't believe it's hard. But it was also a really nice transition from the work that I'd done um, in, in design theory, because a screenplay looks like a product of design. It, it has a lot of constraints around it in terms of length. There are a lot of rules around it, how it's structured, so it has a shape to it. Uh, whereas the, I think novels are considerably more fluid. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there, are, there are Hollywood books around that are, are pretty formulaic. I mean, and um, formulaic, you think, okay, structured. That's my positive take on that. And you say, you know, architecture is formulaic because we have rooms and we have fittings and we have structure, you have foundations, but that doesn't make it not creative. Um, so there were lots of design principles, particularly around creativity, but not just around creativity that I was able to take into screenwriting. And then when I moved um, to novel writing, I was much more conscious than I might otherwise have been about the underlying structure of what I was mm -hmm. writing because I'd taken that from screenwriting. And when I go back to structure, I I'm leaning on what I learned doing my PhD, which is nice because mm -hmm. it took four years out of my life. Yeah, I guess it makes it more comfortable just instead of just going into novel writing and feeling lost. I totally relate to that, yeah. And did you also read a lot of books on novel writing, uh, like story or the story grid and stuff like that? I read a lot of books on screenwriting. Um, I read less on novel writing. Hmm. Once I got to novel writing, I read a couple of books on it. Once I got to novel writing, I actually felt that I had enough foundation to do my own thing. I mean, I read a lot. I read a lot before that. I felt that that was what I was going to lay on top of what I knew about about storytelling and structure. So, and, and I've always sort of understood the the nuts and bolts, the grammar, the sentence structures. And so I've been confident in that space. Yeah, there's also an instinctive part that comes from reading a lot of novels, for sure. You have an ear. You know, you know um, which, which, you know, and I've got a particular way of writing, which, which uh, as I said, is serviceable. It serves the kind of stories that I'm trying to tell. 
so what made you want to write uh, the novel project that we can see right behind you? Was it you wanted to share all these concepts uh, with, had, had you talked to other writers and they just looked at you like they didn't know what you were talking about? And no, no, it was, the opposite pro was the opposite problem that other writers, particularly emerging writers, um, wanted advice um, <laughs> because I, I've been reasonably commercially successful. I mean, the Rosie Project, the series has done about 6 million copies now. So it's really you know, been, been visibly successful. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of writers would, would like to know the secret of that um and you know you would find yourself at a, at a dinner or something like that and someone would say so, so tell me graham I'm, I'm thinking about writing a book what, what advice can you give me and sort of two hours later everybody else has gone home and <laughs> they bored them silly and the wines run out and so forth and i thought as i've done in many other areas of my career as I did with data modeling and so forth i'm going to codify this i'm going to put it down um, it will help me understand um, what I'm doing better. So, you know, sometimes when I'm stuck, I go back to my own book. When I don't actually physically read it, but I think, what would I have told myself? What, are, what would I tell somebody else if they came to me with this problem? So, um, so there was, yeah, in the, the, the motivation was yeah, to, to share, as I always have done, um, what I knew, and it sets a little platform. It says in a way, this is what I know. It's down on paper. Let's let, let, let's have our conversation and my own thinking start from there, from what I know, mm. rather than forever going back to back to base. Yeah. And so did you have a lot of uh, writers that write to you uh, after reading the book? Did you have some exchanges with uh, writers that used this material to, to get their novel done? Yeah, look, I've had a lot of um, really, really positive feedback um, from some from very experienced writers. I mean, I've had experienced writers say, look, I don't like this. I'm a pants or I write by the seat of my pants. All this planning and so on doesn't suit me. And my answer is always, if it's working for you, then I'm not telling you to do it any different way. What I'm saying is if it's not working for you, and sadly there are some very experienced, well, some experienced writers who've perhaps published one book and are struggling with the second one, for example, and they, they and I say, being a pantser, Writing about the city of pants is a decision. It's not identity, you know. And yet, it's sort of like I can't be anything else. That, that's how I am. Um, but look, no, I've had some. I think it, I write, and including this book, out of a compulsion to to create, and you know, e even writing the um, the novel project was a creative act to to, to take everything I had into and to think about it and so on and to do that. But the biggest kick I get out of my writing, the biggest pleasure is when it lands, when something I've written lands with somebody at a time to make some difference in their lives, some positive difference. And look, it might, might just make them laugh when they're in hospital, when they're not, when someone else is in hospital, it might be very small. It might be just a, a good, enjoyable read yeah. when they wanted one. But I know that in the autistic space, there are people who have, um, come out as autistic or I realized they were autistic after reading the rosy books or mm -hmm. understood their partners better, uh, all sorts of things. And people write to you and sometimes and say that, and that's, I mean, that's enormously gratifying. Yeah. Uh, one of my questions was that uh, was this, how, how did you find, uh, how did you first define success when you started out? Was it when you got the book deal? And obviously you just answered how you define success now, but has it changed or was it always the case? Because it was first the creative want, the, the, the need to write, uh, but I guess like making a difference also is a big part of it. Yeah, look, look, I, I didn't I didn't set out to just have a multi-million dot. I, okay, so in fact, it's interesting because it's, it's almost like how do you find, define failure as well? Um, yeah. I, at the beginning of my screenwriting course, um, I mean, I had given up a lot to do this. Um, I had sold my business, which was doing reasonably well and might have become much larger and I could have become much wealthier. And I said, no, I want to do something different with my life. And I was very lucky that I had a partner who was prepared to indulge me in that. Um, but I had a lot at stake and I, and, and I was an older guy and I knew that I had to work hard and have some, some ambitions. And very early in the course, we had to give a presentation on what our ambitions were. And most of the screenwriting students, you know, their ambition was to be able to write an episode or two of a soap opera, and that would be where they started and see where they went from there. A couple thought yeah. it'd be great to make a feature film in Australia. And I said, I want to make a full-on Hollywood major film. And 
okay, so here we are. It's now, that would be uh, 17 years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. I still haven't. <laughs> so in that, in that sense, in that sense, I failed. And indeed, about two years, three years in the course, when I was getting some of these short films, even shown on television, that sort of thing, the head of the school took me aside and said, are you going to be okay, Graham, if you don't get this Hollywood blockbuster because I was so intense about it? I was just worried that I might have you know, suicided or something like that, you know, that I couldn't cope, I had a breakdown or whatever. And I said, look, I am having such a wonderful journey here. It's so exciting to see my work performed. Uh, I'm just loving learning this and gaining the, gaining the skills and the craft. Um, so... So success, what success looks like to me is, as I guess, changed quite a lot as my as my boundaries have expanded. I never thought that my success would look like making a difference in someone's life who thought they might be autistic or something like that. No idea. But you, you know, so you recalibrate that. And if I were to die tomorrow, I would feel I had a, a very gratifying and successful life. I'd be, I'd be very happy with it. Yeah, no, it's interesting. See, so you set a big, very big, goal in the beginning and then it's the journey that becomes interesting and uh, yeah, that yeah and I, would say, and I would say i would say um, when people ask for advice i would say you've got to you've got to know why you're doing this because a lot of people say i want to be a writer and i think it's a fair question to say why is it because you want to see your name in print is it because you know, um you've got something that's very important to say and you want people to hear it is it just the creative urge you know, what, what, what's driving this do you want to make a lot of money you know all sorts of reasons um, and, and if you achieve that, don't complain. So um, for, for me, I, I set my original, once I switched over to novel writing, my goal was I'd like to get a book published. That would be an enormous, and it was something that probably had been with me since I was quite young. I mean, it seemed beyond me, the idea of having a novel published by, you know, by a respectable publisher. Um, and when I actually got it published, when I, when I got the deal with the publisher, I said to myself, Graham, you've achieved that goal. Everything else is on top is, is extra mm -hmm. you have no right to ever complain again and <laughs> at least at least so i mean look yeah there have been moments when i was i can remember watching my book number two on the new york times bestseller list and think, oh, why not number one <laughs> next week number one number one for sure next week it was number four <laughs> i missed it i didn't get it uh, and you know and for you know, for a minute, I was, <laughs> but 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 obviously that the, these are you know, first world problems. <laughs> yeah, very yeah, lucky, for sure. Very lucky to to be in that position. And I, I'm very yeah. conscious of that. No, I, I totally can relate because like even for me, just starting this podcast in the beginning, I was like, I'm gonna get a platform, you know, and thousands of people are gonna follow me, which is not the case. But I'm learning so much. I'm reading books. I'm getting to talk to super interesting people, writers I admire. So everything is the process. It's really, that's interesting. And you know, whatever happens, happens. But if the, you're enjoying the process, I think you're doing good. Yeah, look, there's a, there's a guy in my screenwriting course who um, he, uh, yeah, he worked hard at it and eventually he, he got one one gig, he wrote one, one script, I think, for um, one of the popular soap operas here, The Neighbours, which is a, a sold to the UK mm -hmm. and so on as well. And and then he was an Englishman and he'd come over to Australia and he went back and he never did it again. He worked and he became a postman, I think. Yeah. But he had this thing in his life. He, he said, yeah, no matter what, I went, I, I, I could always say for the rest of my life, I wrote an episode of this popular, this popular series. You know, I, I did it. And, you know, the, these are, these are these sort of milestones rather than having these enormous um, yeah. special goals. And what are you going to do afterwards? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to get back to the creative process. Uh, I was wondering what physical activity and walking in particular uh, does it have in your creative process? Because uh, it's now well documented that when you're stuck in your work, uh, you could just get up, take a walk around. That can help. Uh, I know you've taken it uh, a step further. Uh, you even wrote two books about your walking adventures uh, with the uh, with and used. So I was wondering today when you're not walking the Camino de Santiago, uh, how do you get your creative juices flowing? Is walking still a big part of it? Just maybe taking a walk yeah, and look, talking about the story? Look, I, I, I put aside 45 minutes every day for creative time. Um, and I count that as writing time, as, as, you know, as work time. Um, I'm not 
religious about it, but if I'm writing a draft, I am religious about it. I never miss it when I'm busy writing a draft. I would probably do it five days out of seven the rest of the time, 45 minutes. Um, and what I do, though, is I, as Don Tillman, my protagonist in The Rosie Project, would say, I, I time share it by some other useful activity. So um, I typically do it with, with the walking or the gym. They're the two things that I tend to do. Um, could be driving, but most of the time it's a walk to the market, which is 22 minutes and 22 minutes back. So I've got my 45 <laughs> minutes. Um, do the shopping, but, I, but I'm not thinking about the shopping when I'm walking to the market. Got that organized in advance of that walk to the market, that walk home is just thinking about uh, whatever I'm working on at the moment. And often, um, because of the nature of the creative process, after some incubation period, something will come to me um, that I've been working on earlier and so on. But that, that time is sort of set aside for thinking. Um, paradoxically, I think those really long walks have not been great for creativity. Um, we get a bit, but no more than if I had that 45 minutes walk per day. I mean, Anne and I did a lot of work on the glass house when we were walking uh, the Via Francigena in um, Italy. Um, we, we spent, you know, each day, because we were doing some work on revising it, so one scene each day. But, you know, you ran out of energy after half an hour or so, and you're busy navigating and doing other things at the same time yeah. and taking in the scenery. Um, so, so that's not such... The other thing that we do um, is at the end of the day, if it's just the two of us, which most of the time it is, we uh, have a glass of wine or two, and that's specific creative time for the two of us. We, you know, we don't say, this is our creative time, although yeah. we acknowledge it is, but we say, let's talk about how our books are going. And it might be a common book. It might be individual books. Um, or if there's something else that needs creative thinking, like um, we're going to be we're doing a big book tour coming up and we want to make the events a little bit different. So we say, hey, what, what clever ideas could we do to make an, a book event a bit a bit original, a bit different? And that, that 40 minutes or so as we have that first drink of wine before we really sort of start eating or whatever is well lubricated sort of creative time. Plus all the time you're not talking about it and not consciously thinking is probably also creative time just – without you knowing it, in my opinion. Well, well that's right. That, that's right. Um, but the idea of having this discipline of, of, of actually spending time, that, 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 that quiet time when you're not consciously doing it is not going to do a good job for you if you haven't actually sort of posed the problem and worked a bit on it already. You know, so my, my view is you, you look at the problem, you give it your best shot, you try to articulate it as well as you can, you work hard at it, and if the answer isn't coming, you leave it alone for a while, and the answer mm -hmm. is very likely to come. But you're still going to do the first part. You can't just say leave it alone. Yeah, for sure. So you mentioned the the great Australian bookshop tour uh, yeah. that you were also planning. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that will entail? Well, look, like we um, oddly enough, um, I was very opposed to bookshop tours. I was uh, I'd done a lot of bookshop tours, particularly in the US. You spend it's a They're very hard work, um, particularly in terms of travel, uh, particularly in the US because you're flying between places and so on and you're doing one intense hour or so or two a, a night and then you're flying to another city and so on. And you get, sometimes you get three people in an event. I had an event that nobody showed up to and I was on really? the New York Times. I was top 10 New York Times bestseller list sitting there and it just, and lots of other authors will tell you those sorts of stories. You say, how can this be financially viable? I mean, How many books do you sell? You might sell 10, 15, 20, 50 books in a session. 50 books isn't going to change the world. Yeah. Um, but look, there were all sorts of complicated reasons why publishers um, continue to support book tours. And finally, I think they're backing off doing it. And just as they're backing off, Anne and I said, hey, I reckon we could do this. We could make it work. We're just being contrarians, I think, saying now that everybody doesn't want to do it, let's see if there's a way sure. that we could make it work. So... And we, we, we're not trying to sell as many books as we can. We're trying to um, publicize the book for sure, but we're also using the opportunity to connect with readers, to um, support mental health workers um, and, you know, and, and, support, and support small bookshops. And we'll make a documentary as we do it and so on. So our goal mm -hmm. is visit every bookshop, every bricks and mortar bookshop um, in Australia. So we think there's about... Not, not the second-hand bookshops, not the bookshops that wouldn't stock our book because they only sell, say, religious books or philosophy books or something, or design books. 
but broadly speaking, all the standards of the bookshops in the country, and we think there are about 450. And we wow. have a list <laughs> and we have an itinerary, and it's going to take us about four months. And there's a terrific amount of enthusiasm for it. So we, we are we are looking forward to it, calculatedly. Or we drive to from one to the other? Or Most of it will be, we've got a, an SUV, we've got a, a Toyota Prado, and we'll do most of it in that. A couple of places where we, we at one point we're probably going to fly the uh, truck the car from um, Perth to Sydney and take a plane or, or take the train, in fact, take the train there. Well, the train, a couple yeah. of remote places that will take a plane, but mostly it'll be on the, on the four wheels. Nice. Uh, do you have a uh, special guest uh, planned already in uh, some of these yeah. places? That's the idea. We want to bring in some special guests, be they um, established writers, famous writers, emerging writers, because it's great to give them a platform as well, um, be, it, be they winemakers or musicians or mental health experts, and give them a little time on stage and yeah, make these things yes. interesting. Yeah. Uh, so on the website, you also uh, mentioned uh, that the money w that will be made during this tour will be uh, donated to uh, to uh, mental health. Will it go essentially to research? What's the what's the plan? No. Look, it'll probably, uh, despite Anne being a professor, it will probably go to grassroots organisations that really struggle for money and that may not. Be, look, it won't be a lot of money. You don't make a lot of money out of royalties. So. Rather than putting a very a relatively small amount in a very very large pot, such as the <laughs> sort of money that's around for research, we might target a couple. So there's an organisation that I'm, I'm going to be doing a little bit of work with, which is for um, uh, uh, writers with mental health issues in here in Melbourne. <laughs> so and that's helping them get get work done and run training courses. So I'm going to be doing some um, some seminars or at least one to start with for them. So. That's an organisation that you know even a, you know, a few thousand dollars is going to be is going to be noticeable to them. So. Nice. Um, so I apologise if you get this question a lot, but you mentioned movies and uh, the Hollywood movie is not made yet. But uh, can you tell us if uh, there's something moving for the Rosie Project uh, movie? Yeah, you know all of my books, <laughs> all of my novels have been optioned for movies, and they I know. are in stages <laughs> of development, and I've. Um, been had various stages of involvement myself with screenwriting and so on, um, but look, I, I don't lose sleep at night over it. The, the, the answer is technically it's in it's in development with with Sony Pictures, the Rosie Project. But the issue has traditionally been finding um, the uh, the stars because it's a romantic comedy and they tend to be vehicles for A list actors, um, and you need two in a in a rom com. We've had all sorts of people attached. We've had Jennifer Lawrence attached. We've had uh, Ryan Reynolds attached. Um, most recently, we had Henry Cavill attached. Yeah, very cute, but nothing counts until the cameras roll. And as I, say, I, don't, I just don't lose sleep over it. I say one day I'll get an email perhaps, and I say, camera's about to roll. And I'll say, that's great. I'm going to take that to the bank, and it'll sell a lot more books, and I'll, I'll see it. But you know what? I'll tell you the truth. It's been so many years now since the Rosie Project was optioned as a, as a movie, which would be back in 20, 2014, I think, 2013, 2014. So it's been you know, 10 years now. Um, part of me, do, you know, and I've been paid, part, part of me doesn't want to see it made um, because, you know, I, you know, I'd love to see it made well, but I'd hate to see it not made well. Um, and, and I think there's a bit of fear now around about uh, portrayal of uh, minority groups um, like uh, autistic people and saying you know, there's certainly a strong push to say those people should be portrayed by somebody autistic themselves. Um, you know, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's, so the, these are impediments, in fact, to getting the, the, film, the film made, that the, the studios are treading more cautiously, which is good. Um, but... You know, I think there was something, it was quite a fresh story 10 years ago. I think personally, I'm a big fan. My favorite book in the series is the last one, which is The Rosie Result. Um, and it's a family story. So you've got a kid who's autistic and who's suspected of being autistic and dad is trying to help him. And that's different from a romantic comedy. Um, but, you know, you've got to decide whether there's a market for that type of story. But I think yeah. it's, it's going in a place that, um, that other movies haven't really gone yet, and there's plenty of movies who are going in the same space as the Rosie Project now. Yeah, and I suppose for that to be made, 
they would have to make the first two anyway. <laughs> they well, wouldn't well, go yeah, to I, the I think it might yeah, be, be just trying for an extended TV series or something like that. But, uh, yeah. but I mean, I, I, I am so disconnected from it, to be honest. I might, you, Ernest Hemingway, Hemingway famously said, um, if you write a screenplay, what you do is you drive up to the Hollywood, uh, to the uh, California state line, you throw your screenplay across and get the hell out of there. <laughs> That's a little bit the way it feels. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's next for Dr. Hannah Wright? Uh, you mentioned that you were writing the, the sequel. Uh, is it um, meant to be a three-part uh, series as well? Well, we think we can do eight. Um, <laughs> so, so, so what we're doing is it because she's, Training to become a psychiatrist, and, and as you would know as a doctor, you go through rotations um, in various subspecialties. So she would, over a five-year period, do 10 rotations, 10 six-month rotations. So you could do 10 if you wanted to um, in different um, subspecialties. So the first one, she's in an acute unit, but um, we've got her next. She's in the clinic dealing with the longer-term patients. Um, we, we'll have her doing child and adolescent psychiatry at some stage. We can do forensic psychiatry. She can have a stint in a private clinic. So we, we can really sort of follow her around as, as long as as long as we want to. And the idea is that we shouldn't. The, what keeps us reading, I hope, will be the variety of cases walking in the door. In the same way that a long term TV series would do it. You don't yeah. watch House to see Gregory House's arc over seasons and seasons. You're, well. Perhaps you do, but that's not all you're watching. You're watching for the patient who's come in the door with a previously yeah. unseen disease that was unseen to you, um, and it's going to be fascinating and you're going to engage with their journey. Yeah, well, looking forward. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Graham, for taking the time to be here. Absolute uh, pleasure, Jonathan. Uh, and uh, the book is great, uh, the, the Glass House. Uh, once again, it will be out uh, on March 27th. Is that uh, the right still hasn't moved? It will be out so, March 27th in English. We don't have French translation rights um, sorted yet, but I guess most of your audience is English anyway. Uh, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. We're speaking English here, yeah. 27th of March. Exactly. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, this was the Blood Flow podcast. Everyone, thank you and see you soon. Thanks, John.